um, first, there is un- the, the Biden administration is still undergoing a broad review of U.S.-China policy. There are a number of bills in the Senate um, that will impose sanctions uh, on individuals involved uh, in the Uyghur genocide and that will block um, the export of any goods or products that are made uh, in part through slave labor camps uh, in uh, Xinjiang and that will call on the rest of the world um, to mobilize and to engage uh, against uh, China and China's actions. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the next episode of Conversations. Today, I'm talking to Senator Christopher Coons of Delaware. He's a member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Senator Coons is one of the close confidants of President Joe Biden. He's very influential on foreign policy issues. He has great experience in negotiations, in discussing national security issues, and also issues of global order. Today, I will be talking to him about the growing growing complexity of U.S. relations with China, the issues that are agitating us, the issues that are bringing us closer. I'll also be talking to him about U.S. relations with India, uh, the growing defense partnership with India. And I also will talk to him about the troubling issue of whether the United States will return to JCPOA, the so-called nuclear deal with Iran or not. So on these key issues uh, uh, of international affairs, China, India, and Iran, we have Senator Coons, uh, and I'm extremely grateful for him uh, for showing up on conversations for the second time. The, one of the first things that happened uh, after uh, President Biden took over was a series of reversals of Donald Trump's foreign policy, uh, such as uh, return to the Paris Accords and so on. So there was this perception that there would be a series of reversals when it comes to foreign policy. However, in two or three areas, we seem to see more continuity than reversals. For example, on the issue of China, on the issue of India, and on the issue of Iran, also it seems that there is more continuity between the Biden administration and the Trump administration than the reversals. So if you look at the last meeting between the US administration and the Chinese foreign minister and Tony Blinken in Alaska, I mean, the venue was cold, but the meeting was very hot. So it seemed as if, the U.S. is continuing with the confrontational approach towards China that uh, the Trump administration had adopted. In fact, Tony Blinken in one of his early speeches basically listed eight uh, foreign policy goals in which one was confronting China and he used the phrase confronting China. How do you see the Alaska meeting and what is going on between the U.S. and China since uh, President Biden took over? Well, Dr. Khan, it's great to be on with you. Thank you uh, for hosting me for a conversation. Um, I have discussed uh, with Secretary Blinken and National Security Advisor Sullivan um, their meeting uh, with senior Chinese diplomats in Anchorage. Um, And my view is this is not as simple as an on-off switch. Either they're reversing the Trump administration's policies or they're following them. The relationship between the United States and China is very complex. Uh, and our relations with the Indo-Pacific uh, region and with our allies, um, our partners, our treaty allies, as well as those countries who are um, sort of largely caught in between between the United States and China. It's a very complex uh, series of relationships across the region. Um, while the opening public session of that discussion between uh, U.S. and Chinese senior diplomats was a little spicy, had a little heat to it, Um, They had an eight hour long series of conversations in Anchorage that were broadly speaking substantive, that were um, an important opportunity for a new administration in the United States to lay out uh, what are our clear lines and to hear what are their clear lines and then to talk about um, three different, broadly speaking, three different areas. Uh, Where are the areas of potential conflict, um, which is at least better understood by having clarity about Uh, red lines for both countries. What are the areas where we will compete and compete vigorously and even confront each other, um, but where we hope to do so without it escalating into conflict? And what are the areas of cooperation? Um, What is it that we can and should do together to combat climate change, to deal with nuclear proliferation, to um, deal with terrorism, and to deal with the response uh, to the COVID-19 pandemic, yes, but to global public health challenges. I'll remind you, even at the height of the Cold War with the Soviet Union, um, we were finding uh, places where we could cooperate with them from space exploration to 
negotiating nuclear arms control treaties, um, even while we were preparing for the possibility of all out warfare between our nations. So um, we have fewer um, lines of communication, um, direct relationships between our military and the Chinese military, even than we did with the Soviets at the height of the Cold War. We need to do more to make sure that we don't inadvertently um, have a ship to ship collision as we're doing freedom of navigation operations in the South China Sea uh, or have um, a mid air collision. Um, we've had some very close calls in recent years. Um, we also need to be clear about what our goals are and what our main concerns are. The one area where I agreed with President Trump's uh, confrontation strategy with the Chinese was around intellectual property, was around IP theft and forced IP tech transfer, um, and the ways in which China has adopted over a number of years a policy I've called innovation mercantilism. Um, and one of the areas where I strongly disagreed with the Trump administration um, was the ways in which they used tariffs and other uh, burden sharing agreements uh, to really frankly go after and undermine our relationships with critical treaty allies um, like South Korea and Japan. I think it was a critical signal um, that our Secretary of Defense and Secretary of State um, had constructive meetings with our Japanese and South Korean uh, allies before they went to Anchorage for the meeting with the Chinese. Um, and I think moving forward, um, directly engaging the Quad, um, South Korea, India, um, Japan, uh, and Australia with a head of state meeting, uh, which was critical, hadn't happened before uh, in March, was a great way for us to open what will be the next chapter um, of U.S.-Chinese relations. You know, forgive the pun, but what are the red lines? You know, like for China, that uh, China insists that we should not cross. I mean, they seem to be saying that we should not uh, interfere in their internal affairs, like not talk about the treatment of Uyghurs, their heavy-handed approach to handling Hong Kong situation, uh, so, so, and of course the Taiwan issue. So uh, are we going to respect those red lines? Well, remember, I'm speaking on behalf of myself as a senator, not on behalf of the Biden administration. I'm not part of the administration, although I um, strongly supported uh, President Biden's campaign and um, consider myself to have a close and good working relationship uh, with senior levels of the administration. So for anyone who's watching, just remember that what I'm telling you is my opinion, not a characterization of those negotiations. Um, the Chinese for decades have been consistent in saying um, that they don't believe it's an appropriate uh, area for the United States to comment on their own internal human rights issues. I think it is absolutely uh, not only appropriate, but essential for us uh, to speak up about their brutal uh, repression of uh, human rights and democracy in Hong Kong, which is a violation of a treaty commitment they made, um, and um, their actions, um, which are have been called a genocide uh, by our Secretary of State against uh, the Uyghurs in Xinjiang province. Um, I think it is absolutely appropriate uh, for us to hold them to account globally uh, for their own internal human rights violations. They have made a real point of saying that the United States is hypocritical um, and attacking um, racial inequalities and the mistreatment of African Americans. Um, something bluntly about which I think the United States has been open and transparent, uh, where it was one of the core issues in the campaign and where President Biden uh, and many of us in Congress have said we intend to address these issues and make progress um, towards them. I think that's the core difference between an open society, a democracy, uh, and a closed authoritarian society. The Chinese say it's nobody's business uh, how we treat our own people. Um, we say it is something about which um, we ought to be able to call them out and we ought to be held accountable for inequalities uh, in our own country. You know, if you remember just before the transition of power, Secretary Pompeo visited Turkey and he was trying to lecture uh, the Turkish government on its treatment of Christian minorities and the Turkish foreign minister came back and started talking about uh, Black Lives Matter. And uh, so, so uh, and you know that the United States now on various democracy in the indices is now rated as a struggling democracy. We are not a full democracy. There are more than 20 countries in the world which are rated higher on the democracy index for us. So, so uh, do you think it's going to become difficult for the US to push for human rights, uh, respect for human rights in other countries while we continue to have uh, issues of voter suppression and 
police brutality, which is so highlighted by our own media and our own leaders. Let, please help me understand your question. What is your question? My question is that are we weakened when it comes to democracy promotion worldwide because democracy at home is weak? I disagree that democracy at home is weak. Uh, I disagree that we are a struggling democracy um, and, and I'll push back hard on that mischaracterization. Um, we obviously have significant challenges. The riot at the Capitol on January 6th, um, where I was in the Capitol at the time, um, and where a majority of the Republican caucus in the House, even after um, rioters uh, breached the Capitol and threatened the lives of the Vice President and Speaker of the House, I think this was um, a gravely concerning event, something that did weaken our reputation globally. Uh, but it's also important to be clear that we went back into the chambers of the House and Senate and finished the certification of the election, and we had the inauguration of a duly elected president. There are other countries around the world where election violence um, is a commonplace and where there are coups and counter coups. Um, I think American democracy um, needs to be reinvigorated. I think we need to look hard at our electoral practices um, and at rebuilding some of the consensus around the legitimacy of our government. The fact that our second, one of our two major political parties um, has a majority of its members uh, rejecting the legitimacy of our current president, believing that he wasn't actually legitimately elected. That is a core concern for me. Um, but I frankly don't think that these dramatic and difficult incidents mean that we should somehow retreat to the United States uh, and refuse to speak about democracy or engage in human rights. We should do so with humility. We should do so with some clarity about the struggles that we've had. Um, but as I have spent time talking with foreign ministers, with heads of state, uh, with representatives from uh, parliaments and national assemblies in other parts of the world, um, they are asking us to, to not to shrink back and to say that we have nothing to say about democracy in other parts of the world, but to own this and say democracy is hard. Um, democracy takes determination and reinvestment and reinvigoration. One of the bills that I've introduced is a bipartisan bill. It's in both the House and the Senate that would invest a billion dollars in teaching civics in the United States at the K through 12 level, at the college and university level, and through nonprofits that help deliver curricular components to make it easier for Americans to better understand our own history and our own struggles. Democracy is a very hard form of government to sustain over a long period of time. And democracy globally is on its back foot. Um, but one of the things I am most excited about, Dr. Khan, is that there is a bipartisan bill advancing in the Senate um, that will reinvigorate and reinvest in American innovation, manufacturing, supply chains, competitiveness. The best way for us to confront China's aggressive actions, um, advocating for and advancing authoritarianism in the world, digital authoritarianism is something they are exporting, is for us to show that we are clear-eyed about the problems our own democracy is having, and we're going to reinvest in ways that we can deliver uh, on the American dream um, for that portion of the American populace that has really not seen any progress in their wages or their opportunity or their inclusion uh, over decades. You know, uh, President uh, Biden, when talking about Xi Jinping, actually used the phrase to say that he has no democratic bone in his body. And it was an interesting quote. Uh, and he also said something which is very interesting. He said that this is a struggle between autocracy and democracy. And as you know, that I just organized a, a symposium talking about how the struggle between the US and China is a struggle between autocracy and democracy. However, if you remember during the Rwandan crisis, one of the allegations was that the US did not act uh, early on to prevent the genocide there. And the argument was that it wasn't labeled as a genocide. The US is required by law to to act if some a particular uh, crime is labeled as a genocide. But uh, the previous administration and the current administration both acknowledged that what is happening to the Uyghurs is a form of genocide. So that means that the US will have to you know, act seriously. Uh, and uh, do you see any ma major uh, actions taken by the US towards China and what would they be on this particular issue of genocide uh, of Uyghurs? 
Um, so um, first, there is un- the, the Biden administration is still undergoing a broad review of U.S.-China policy. There are a number of bills in the Senate um, that will impose sanctions uh, on individuals involved uh, in the Uyghur genocide and that will block um, the export of any goods or products that are made uh, in part through slave labor camps uh, in uh, Xinjiang and that will call on the rest of the world um, to mobilize and to engage uh, against uh, China and China's actions. One of our challenges is the limited range of options we've got. Rwanda, as you know, is a tiny remote African country. China is the second largest economy in the world. Most of our uh, partners and allies um, have close economic relations with China and have so far shown um, themselves to be hesitant to impose the kinds of sanctions that would actually um, have bite and have some costs uh, to China. So um, this is one of the debates we're having, is whether or not we should um, try and decouple um, the United States and Chinese economies, or whether we should um, continue with this uh, range of options between cooperation, competition, and confrontation. Um, it is not as simple as saying um, the Chinese are comparable to the Nazis. You know, we're in the middle of a world war with them. Um, we have no commerce with them. We have no technology uh, or human exchange uh, ties with them. This is simple. We're going to cut them off and we're going to go to war with them. Um, so we have not had a situation where we declared the actions uh, of a major global power to be genocide uh, and figuring out exactly what our options are going forward in terms of imposing sanctions, imposing costs and isolating the PRC. That is one of the big diplomatic challenges that we face right now. I agree. It's a complex issue with a lot of financial and economic interdependence between the two countries. You know, it's going to be challenging. I I want to ask you a couple of questions about India. Uh, You know, it was interesting to see that uh, Secretary of State was talking to China and the Secretary of Defense was in India at roughly the same time, which kind of are the two prongs of U.S. engagement with China, actually. So my question to you is this, that as the strategic value of uh, India increases, uh, as, we, as the tensions between, say, U.S. and China and the confrontation increases, India will become more and more strategically significant. And now we already have several defense uh, treaties. We call India a major defense. But India also has its own human rights problems with the passage of the Citizenship Amendment Act the way it treated the Kashmiris uh, during the COVID you know, lockdown for over a year. Is it possible that we can maintain our strategic partnership with India and also uh, question its human rights situation, especially with regards to religious minorities? We, we have to be able to have both conversations. I mean, the United States and India are the world's two largest, most populous democracies. And in my visit to India in 2017, I was um, encouraged to see the dramatic progress that's being made in India in terms of lifting people out of poverty um, and uh, how technologically advanced, how sophisticated, how uh, important a partner uh, India is for the United States. Um, But um, just as in the United States under our last administration, um, there was a so-called Muslim ban, a travel ban that I think violates some of our most core and treasured principles of uh, not discriminating against people based on their religious beliefs. So too, I think there are some very challenging developments in India, in the Indian democracy, in terms of the treatment, in particular of the Muslim minority, but of uh, many other um, uh, communities within India. India and the United States are both continental, multi-faith, multilingual um, democracies, federal states um, that have Um, a very robust and complicated internal composition. And if we are to be good and reliable partners for the long haul, we have to be able to critique each other in terms of our fidelity to these fundamental principles of democracy and human rights. Uh, India and China have recently had border clashes up in the Kashmir. And we have to recognize that India is a state Uh, is a nation that I believe um, has a great promise for the United States as a partner. Uh, But just as the United States is not perfect, neither is India perfect. Um, And we have to be continuing to hold each other accountable uh, for ways in which we are um, not yet uh, fully uh, living up to the the inspirational values of our founding documents. 
you know, it's, it's interesting that the people to people relation between the US and India has always been absolutely fantastic. And India mm-hmm. has such a huge diaspora in the US. You're talking to one who I, I was born in India, I grew up there. So given this, uh, this people to people relationship, isn't it important that, that this, this relationship be anchored not just based on strategic uh, necessities, but also on values? You know, so yes. the, the aspect of values. And if we are going to be talking about autocracy versus democracy uh, when competing with China, then it is essential that both uh, India as well as the U.S. Uh, shore up their own democratic credentials vis-a-vis especially religious and racial minorities. Yes. One of the things that's happened uh, in the region in the last few years is that Australia, which had been had been sort of seesawing between uh, China and the United States, there was a, a widely read book uh, in Australia um, that was essentially arguing that inevitably Australia would have to move towards being aligned more closely with China than the United States, given its sort of regional location. Um, then it became abundantly clear to the Australian public that China was directly and inappropriately, both overtly and covertly interfering uh, in their political system. Uh, and the views of most Australians has now moved very strongly and um, that they are pushing back fairly hard on Chinese interference and um, inappropriate ways in which uh, China has tried to uh, sort of muscle the Australian body politic. Uh, my hunch is that um, we've now got Australia very strongly in our corner in terms of how they view China and how they view the future of um, Australian democracy. My hunch is that similar incidents will happen in India um, that will lead um, Indian um, leaders, uh, elected leaders, uh, and Indian nationalists to begin to question uh, whether they are better off uh, being a democracy, being an open society, and reinforcing um, the importance of treating religious minorities uh, in a respectful and an appropriate way, uh, as opposed to leaning more towards China. It, look, India has a long tradition as a non-aligned nation, really, for a, a period of decades, the leader of the non-aligned movement uh, during the U.S.-Soviet Cold War. Um, and I respect and understand that there are some significant differences in our cultures, our histories, our traditions, but our values being structured as countries that are rooted in the rule of law, the rights of the individual, and in democracy, um, where change happens regularly and through hopefully peaceful democratic processes. That's a fundamental difference uh, from a one-party state um, that surveils and um, uh, manages and suppresses um, the opinions and the actions of um, hundreds of millions of individuals, which is essentially where China is and is going. So um, my hope is that the United States and India uh, will clo- will form a closer and more enduring relationship, a relationship rooted in values um, and a relationship that is values first and strategic interests second. Um, there is an important uh, point of tension in our relationship right now, which is India's expressed intention to purchase uh, the Russian S-400 missile defense system. My hope is that we can navigate this uh, by being clear um, but respectful about the consequences for our strategic relationship if they were to uh, procure and deploy this system. Um, this has caused real challenges in our relationship with Turkey, as you well know. Um, and, and I think it, it makes good sense that if we've spent billions and billions of dollars in developing a next generation fighter, um, that we would expect our close strategic allies to not then purchase a Russian system that will send uh, data and details and understanding of how to shoot down this next generation fighter um, to one of our most critical um, security competitors, Russia. That, that is more of a tactical issue. You know, India desperately wants some of our drones, <laughs> so we could probably handle it at that level. You're not getting drones. Uh, my question to you is this, uh, you see, the Democratic Party is center left, whereas the, the BJP is center right. Uh, are you at all worried about the rise of Hindu nationalism uh, and the uh, Hindutva movement in India, of which uh, Prime Minister Modi is the leader? Uh, I mean, the values that it espouses, uh, the trajectory seems that it will be like a Hindu Iran down the line if, if it becomes a Hindu state. Uh, so uh, are we planning that as we continue to make uh, strategic commitments to India? Well, 
I'm, I'm not sure about how you phrased your so, question. We are certainly are, not planning for India to become no, no, a we, version I, of Iran, which is, I think, the way you just framed it. I, I'm saying that the trajectory of India looks as if it is moving forward to become a Hindu state. And there are members of the Bharatiya Janata Party who yeah. actually say that they are already a Hindu nationally. So you have a Hindu religious state like the Islamic State of Iran. So that's why so, I said it could be a Hindu Iran. Let me just comment if I can. Um, you know, look, I, I'm, I'm someone who happens to be Christian and we just celebrated one of the major uh, sort of important days on the Christian religious calendar. Yesterday was Palm Sunday. Um, I, I oppose the idea of Christian nationalism in the United States. Um, we, we have to be uh, welcoming, supportive, respectful of, of a very wide range of religious uh, expression and uh, of space for people who, who do not affiliate or associate with any particular religious tradition. There has to be in the United States, this has to be a secular state and it has to be a state that respects and supports uh, freedom of worship and freedom of religious expression if we're to be true to our founding documents. And that's a really challenging um, space for the United States to maintain. Um, and, and frankly, I think it's a challenging space uh, for our trusted allies and partners around the world to maintain. But Sudan um, shows us a cautionary note of what happens when uh, a state becomes not just an Islamic Republic uh, governed by Sharia law, but then continues in that journey. Um, there are developments um, even this week in Sudan where they are moving back uh, towards declaring Sudan um, a, a, a secular state. Um, the Islamic Republic of Iran, as you commented, um, after the 1979 revolution um, has viewed itself uh, as uh, a, a, um, a state committed to the export of a revolutionary uh, Islamist ideology. Um, I would say those are very cautionary notes for India, that India, if it is to maintain uh, its place in the world as a leading democracy, a multi-faith, multi-ethnic, multilingual democracy, um, further moving towards being a Hindu nationalist state um, I, I think undermines um, its path in that direction. And that's one of the core sort of identity challenges that many democracies uh, face is when you too closely uh, align um, particular identity, particular religion with a state, um, then, then you end up with significant challenges in terms of the future of that being a genuinely democratic state as well. About the JCPOA, is there any hope that we will be back in the JCPOA or, or not? I mean, I, I think the ball is in their court uh, right now. Um, Iran's initial demands that the United States unilaterally lift all sanctions um, before we would um, re-enter compliance for compliance is a non-starter. Um, there's been, you know, sort of an offer back and forth. Um, in, in my view, uh, in the five years since the JCPOA, um, we saw a, a significant failure on the part of the Iranian leadership to grasp the moment um, and to reduce or rein in their support for proxies, their ballistic missile program, their funding of terrorism. Um, the, the war in Yemen is one of the great humanitarian disasters uh, in, in the modern era. Um, and that conflict, really a proxy conflict between the Saudis and the Iranians, um, has produced just devastating consequences uh, for the many people. Um, and, you know, the United States has a clear and firm position that Iran should not have a nuclear weapon. And there are critics of the JCPOA, there are supporters of the JCPOA, both in Congress um, and supporters in the administration. Um, and I think finding a path back towards uh, full compliance with the JCPOA and a path forward towards negotiating uh, a broader agreement that includes um, the ballistic missile program and the support for proxies and for regionally destabilizing actions by Iran is, is a critical challenge for the administration. Um, there's senators on both sides of the aisle that want to work with the administration um, to make sure that we're uh, consulting not just with our European and regional partners, but with Congress um, and finding a path forward. But, you know, frankly, in the run up uh, to Iranian uh, elections, it will be a challenge to see what their position will be and what it is they're going to offer. Um, I think that the um, sanctions that were imposed um, by the Obama administration got Iran and, and before, um, got Iran to a place where they were willing to negotiate. 
Um, that took a great deal of global coordinated pressure uh, by a global um, uh, partnership amongst all the major countries that were uh, customers for Iranian oil. We're now in a quite different place uh, where the Iranians are continuing to find uh, partners to whom they export oil. Um, and the United States is still continuing to try and impose maximum pressure from sanctions. Um, we're in a very difficult situation. So uh, my hope is that we will resume negotiations, um, but that they will be negotiations, not just for JCPOA compliance, but for a broader uh, range of issues. Um, and right now I continue to talk with colleagues in the Senate, uh, as well as to hear from uh, ambassadors from our um, critical allies in this partnership. I, I don't know this, but I'm certain uh, it was on the table um, in Anchorage. Um, where there was that eight hour conversation about where are we going together? Uh, if the Russians and the Chinese, as well as the Europeans are committed to continuing um, our efforts to prevent Iran from developing a nuclear weapon or enough fissile material um, to, to, get, to get a nuclear device, uh, then we've got the beginnings of a meaningful negotiation. You know, uh, as far as the JCPOA was concerned, even when the Trump administration pulled off, pulled out of it. It was the U.S. which withdrew from the JCPOA. And even then, uh, the global uh, opinion was that Iran was complying with the JC JCPOA's requirements. It was yes. the U.S. which withdrew. And then we imposed new sanctions after that. So if we are going to go back, uh, I, I, I'm not very sure how the ball is in Iran's court uh, to, to, to come back into JCPOA. It was not Iran that left it. I also want to alert you to this new development. Uh, Wang Yi, the foreign minister of China, just went to Iran and announced a $400 billion deal for the I'm next well 25 years. Yeah, and that is probably going to undermine this effort by the United States to develop uh, this full pressure or all court pressure, whatever you would like to call on Iran. So it's quite possible that uh, our allies, the P5 plus one, that was Germany and the Security Council members, uh, may start uh, building independent relations with Iran if the U.S. continues. No, the, the Chinese have been at this for some time. This is not a new development. Uh, but I, I'm well aware of this uh, recent development where the Chinese are doing even more to undermine any possible uh, global pressure campaign. Um, that was a campaign carried out by our allies uh, and by those who I would not call our allies, but at best maybe for some period of time our partners in that effort. Look, the Chinese and the Russians continue to say that they also think it is not in the interests of global security uh, for Iran to have a nuclear weapon, um, but they are doing what they need to do to provide them with an alternative path and to reduce the impact of sanctions and pressure on them. So um, look, both North Korea and Iran, um, I view as destabilizing, um, threatening nations um, and you know, we could talk all day about who's responsible, who's not responsible. Um, in my view, um, Iran has done a great deal to destabilize the Middle East. And um, the most promising path forward that I've heard proposed in Congress uh, is one that Senators Menendez and Graham have been trying to get some support for, which would reimagine this as a regional conversation where we say uh, to our uh, partners, um, you know, the Emiratis and the Saudis, as well as the other uh, Gulf uh, kingdoms, um, that no one in the Gulf uh, is going to be allowed to enrich um, and that we will engage in negotiations around civil nuclear power for the entire region. Um, and uh, we will find a path forward uh, with Iran where we eliminate sanctions and they uh, give up not only um, any uh, nuclear weapons ambitions they have, but also give up enrichment. Um, and there is a path there. I don't know if the Iranians will even be willing to discuss it, um, but you know there is as much tension between the Saudi Kingdom um, and the Islamic Republic as there is between the United States and Iran. It is, after all, the Iranians who were firing missiles into Riyadh um, from Yemen <laughs> um, and, and has attacked directly uh, the Saudi Kingdom and some of its oil refining operations and ships in the last two years. So um, this is a tough, tough region um, and one that has um, um, been, been difficult for the United States and for those who are hopeful about peace for some time. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Senator Coons, for taking time out and talking to me. 
Uh, it was very enlightening. My students and uh, people in Delaware are very grateful for all the wonderful work you do for us uh, in Washington. And I hope to talk to you again soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Khan. Great being on with you.